Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, why don't we get started? So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, David Walker from Princeton University. David is now a member of the Secret Society of Tenured Professors. So <laughs> he's uh, passed through the uh, difficult stage and now gets to sit in retirement for the rest of his career. <laughs> but actually, David, David has done lots of great stuff. Um, uh, ma many of the people here have uh, connections with David, and I think he's going to be talking to us about some new uh, work, at least work that I haven't seen before. So, David. Thanks. All right, yeah, so um, thanks for having me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some work that I've been doing over the last couple of years um, with uh, some collaborators uh, at AT&T, uh, primarily Kathleen Fisher um, and um, Yitzhak Mandelbaum was one of my uh, graduate students at Princeton who's graduated and uh, taken a research position at AT&T. And Chan uh, is a new student of mine that's uh, started working on this stuff, and, and Kenny is a, a postdoc. Um, right, so I normally have to say that, well, all the credit is theirs and all the problems are mine. So there we go. <laughs> okay, so the, the overall um, starting point for talking about this stuff is that there's lots and lots of data all over the place. Um, and uh, many of it is uh, what one would call semi-structured data, but it isn't uh, necessarily in a standard format like uh, XML or uh, HTML. So, Systems are producing all kinds of uh, web logs. There are um, statistics that show up all the time on my hockey uh, discussion boards. AT&T has tons of information pertaining to uh, phone call and, and billing. Um, and financial transactions are uh, in their own strange format. Scientists, like biologists, have um, microDNA data and genomics data. So there's all kinds of, of different um, bits of data uh, from all over the place. And um, uh, there are a lot of problems with this data. Sometimes it has no documentation. Uh, the formats can be evolving. Uh, and with little documentation, you can um, run into errors um, uh, all the time when the formats are changing and, and people don't know exactly which way is what. Uh, and many of these uh, data sources also have uh, huge volumes that uh, we have to deal with when we're building tools. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of what I'm talking about, um, uh, web servers uh, generate logs to tell you uh, all the requests um, that have come in. Uh, and they have information like IP addresses and dates uh, and um, structured requests um, and um, information about errors and responses. Uh, AT&T has similar kinds of log files that um, uh, catalog the process of um, assigning a phone number uh, to someone new. So these are huge logs that uh, tell you what states the process of somebody getting a new uh, phone number is in. And again, it's combinations of phone numbers, other kinds of numbers, various different uh, names of states in the process. Biologists like uh, Olga Troinskaya at Princeton are developing new systems for uh, integrating lots of different um, experiments that researchers do and then post on the web. Um, and um, Here's a little bit of data from um, a website, a Gene Ontology, a website that tells you about connections between different uh, processes that go on uh, inside um, cells. And so there's identifiers for the different processes and names, and there's definitions and various identifiers that uh, forge connections between the different parts of the document. Um, oh, my, this is my last one. Um, I'm a big, I'm a big fat hockey fan, and I've always wanted to be able to give a talk about uh, it includes some sort of hockey data. And now since I have tenure, I finally can. Uh, so on, my, um, on my, my various hockey boards, people post all kinds of different statistics. Uh, and at the beginning of the hockey season, uh, what you want to do is you want to go and grab a whole bunch of these statistics from different places uh, and um, perform some analysis of them so you can pick the hockey players for your hockey pool uh, in a way such as uh, to defeat um, all the, the non-computer scientists uh, in the crowd, which over the last couple of years I've been pretty good at. I have the number one hockey team in my, my pool right now. 
But anyway, the main point is there's lots and lots of, of data. Uh, and um, what I want to do is I want to help people build uh, the arrow in this, uh, in this diagram that from all this kind of odd ha ad hoc data um, provides you with a bunch of uh, end user tools. Um, a tool that will take that data and um, convert it into the right format to feed directly into your database. A uh, tool that will take the data and uh, convert it into a more standard form such as uh, XML so that standard programming tools uh, and um, other kinds of tools can, can work directly on your, your ad hoc data. Uh, and also build um, tools that will um, take a look at the data uh, and determine where there are problems. So all of the different kinds of uh, errors in the data can indicate where other processes that are generating the errors uh, are going wrong uh, and need to be addressed. Right, so from raw data, we'd like to create a bunch of tools for processing that data. And oftentimes that means converting it into more standard formats that other existing uh, databases or tools uh, can deal with. All right, so halfway there, um, this is um, the first version of the uh, PADS system. Uh, the idea is you have a, an ad hoc data source, uh, and the first thing you do as a programmer is you write uh, a PADS description in, this, in a little domain-specific language that describes the syntax of your data and some of its semantic properties. Then a uh, compiler takes that description, you feed it through the compiler, and it generates a bunch of libraries for parsing, printing, traversal of the data structure, uh, and validation uh, that the data meets the various properties that you've specified. Uh, then you can link those generated libraries to a runtime system uh, that deals with I.O. and a bunch of error handling. Uh, and you can also link the generated libraries and the runtime system to a bunch of tool stubs, such as an XML converter or a data profiler, um, or even uh, the the grandest tool of all is, a, is an xQuery query engine. Uh, so um, each of these tools are defined uh, in some sense by um, induction over the structure of the, the description or um, term by um, <laughs> just they're driven by the, the yeah I do have a cell phone in my pocket. I'll just Okay, so anyway, so there's a bunch of these tools here um, that are um, driven by the structure of, or operate um, by the structure of the description uh, that gets generated. So then you can go ahead and take your ad hoc data source, um, run it through the generated system, generate XML data instead of your ad hoc data, gener generate error reports that tell you where the errors are, generate a graph, or uh, use a query engine to, to generate some results. Uh, and you can also link your data source against a, um, or it also generates a programming interface so you can write your own custom application to do whatever you want with, uh, with the data. Okay, so what does the PADS language look like? Well, um, it's a language in which one specifies data sources by a group of extended type declarations. Okay, so there's a, a rich library of base types uh, for things like integers of different sizes. Um, there are things like strings that are terminated by a particular character, like a vertical bar. They're fixed width strings. Um, they're strings that match regular expressions. Um, and then um, because we're really focused a lot on systems data and log files that are generated, um, there is a lot of um, specific systemz style base types like dates and times and IP addresses and, and URLs. Uh, in addition to these base types, there are um, a number of constructors that allow you to uh, build larger descriptions. So there are constructors that deal with sequences, such as um, structs or record types, array types. There are, are structures that deal with uh, choices, like unions, enumerations, switch statements. Uh, there are constraints, and then there's uh, parameterization and dependency. And we'll see some examples of these things in a second. So the basic idea is that uh, the reason we use types is because these types uh, can have more than one different interpretation. On the one hand, they can be interpreted as a grammar for uh, the data that 
um, you're interested in parsing. On the other hand, they can also be interpreted as a type for the data structure that is resulting from the parser. So a single definition uh, has these multiple different uh, interpretations that uh, are important for programming these kinds of applications. It's also the case that um, along with an internal representation, you get an auxiliary structure uh, that we call a parse descriptor that describes where the errors in uh, the data were found. Okay, and the shape of that parse descriptor, parse descriptor mirrors the shape of the data representation you get, and it's also generated from the, uh, the type that the, the programmer has specified. Um, and there are other key tools as well that go in the opposite direction. So there's a printer that takes um, a representation and generates uh, data in the right format. Okay, so as an example of how this pads language works, um, you know, one thing I should do actually is I should keep track of um, how much time I have and oh. when I should stop. And so we have the run until noon. I wouldn't recommend no. talking to but if you run over past in an hour, don't feel like you have to stop abruptly. Okay. Hopefully I'm aimed for about an hour or a little less. Okay, so that's, that would be by 11.30 on the clock at the back. Okay, excellent. All right, so um, here is, so here's an example of one of the lines in our, um, the log file for one of our web servers. Okay, um, it's got a bunch of different components to it. The first component's an IP address, and there's a couple of spaces, and there's some dashes. Um, and the dashes are usually a dash, but sometimes um, they're um, uh, an identifier that uh, identifies some remote entity or an authenticated user. Uh, then there is a time at which the request to the web server was made. Uh, and then there's a, a string surrounded by quotes that has some structure to it that explains um, what kind of request was made. Um, so in this case, um, a GET request for that uh, URL was made. Uh, and uh, also the version of the protocol that was used to make that request. Uh, and at the end, there's a response code um, and um, the number of bytes that were returned from the request. Okay, so here's what it looks like to specify that kind of line in the data using uh, PADS description, okay? So there's a couple of versions of PADS. There's actually one for the functional language OCaml. There's another for C. Um, I'm going with the C version, although probably the OCaml one would be just as familiar for most people in the, the audience. So um, the idea is we have a struct definition. Um, and like in C, that declares a record. Okay? And the names of the fields of the record are highlighted in blue. Uh, and each of those fields also has um, a type associated, like the field name client has a type host, uh, the field remote ID um, has the type auth ID, auth has type auth ID, the field date has the type pdate, okay? So, um, and then in between each field, there's uh, some punctuation specifiers. So I could read this in terms of uh, a type as a record with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different named fields. Uh, and I can also read it as a grammar um, that says the first thing that I parsed is something with type host, where host is defined elsewhere. Then I parse a space. Uh, then I parse something that's an auth ID. Then I parse another space. Then I parse something else that's an auth ID. Then I parse a space plus a bracket. Then I parse a date, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it has these two different views, one as uh, the type in C and another as um, a parser. Okay, so we can dig down a little and see how these different fields, um, the types of different fields are, are defined. So here's a definition of a, a type called ID. Okay, and there's, um, it's a union, so there's two different possibilities. Okay, the first possibility is it's just a character um, and it's gonna be called the unavailable, um, and um, it has to just be the um, singleton dash. The other possibility is that it's a string uh, ending with a space. Okay, so the semantics of such a union is that the first branch in the union is tried first, and the second branch is tried second, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so that describes these, each of these little dashes in here. Okay. Then um, there are also array types. Okay. Um, so we might describe an IP address uh, as um, an array of unsigned integers eight uh, bits wide. There's going to be four of them. Um, and there's going to be a separator in between each of the um, array elements that's a period, um, and it's going to be terminated by a space. Okay, so um, arrays, um, again, there's internally, they just become an array. Externally, you can view them as a grammar for, a, um, um, for some data, and they're much like, um, they're much like the, an extended Kleene star from regular expressions. Okay, so. Are you going to talk about sort of the uh, ambiguity to match? I mean, okay, um, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to talk about that, um, really, except to say that. Um, so here you can see there's some ambiguity going on. Uh, so um, PADS ambiguity disambiguation is very simple. It, it's simply. Uh, takes the the first match, say in the union, oh, okay. um, and, um, um, and once you've matched on a field in the struct, you're not going to go. Back I'm not. We're not. There's not going to be any backtracking ever. Okay. Um, there are pros and cons to that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here is another struct that describes um, a request. Uh, and uh, this struct has three fields. It has a method, a, rec a qu request URI, and a version. Uh, and the interesting thing about this example um, is that uh, the version, uh, not only does it have to um, have this type, so it has to satisfy uh, the requirement of HTTP underscore V, whatever that type is, uh, it also has to satisfy the constraint that's defined by this function check version. So check version is a, a function described up here, uh, and um, it takes a pair of arguments, uh, and basically it checks that um, that um, if you have the link or unlink method, uh, you'd better be in version 1.0 and, and not a higher version, because those apparently were deprecated after version 1.0. So the point here is that. Um, in order to check deeper properties of your program, you can write um, any arbitrary function that you'd like. Uh, and uh, checking those properties can depend upon uh, earlier uh, elements uh, in your structure. Uh, so there's some dependency that's going on here uh, and the checking of some predicates. OK. How does the checking of the predicate integrate with the parser? So the parsing um, generates data representations. Uh, and each of those representations um, have data structures that are given by the types. And so um, I can use version. Oh, that's supposed to be. Yeah, so version, it comes from here. So. Um, the data structure that you pass to this function as an argument will um, have the type given by HTTP. But, but could I use that to sort of uh, roll back the parse and try an alternative? Yes, no, so no, you can't. It, it, um, these should be functional. Um, uh, well, even if it's functional, it's more of a question of your parse algorithm where they have backtracking. Ah, I see. So uh, if this field doesn't match, then it would try the next one. So sort of related to Tom's question earlier. Um, so it, within a union, uh, it tries the first branch, tries the second branch, tries the third branch. And if it fails. In a struct, it's going to fail. In a struct, it's going to fail. Ah, sorry. Yeah. So right. So yeah, my bad. Okay. So in a, in a, right. So there is no, yeah, here it will just fail if that, if that you, constraint. You so you're going to try try the other. So if you had if you had different 
if you had different um, criteria that you would you would put this in a union instead of putting it in a struct is what I should say. So you can introduce backtracking, limited backtracking where you want. And you can do it with the, with the predicate. And you can do it with the predicate. Okay. Um, the next example is a little bit like that, but um, but not exactly. Um, so here is a case where we have a union, um, and the idea is that there's some um, header that we've previously parsed, okay, and we pass in um, through this parameter which uh, some integer which tells us, for instance, what the payload of our uh, packet is going to look like, and um, we can switch on this argument to say, oh, in this case, try this one. In this case, try that one. In this case, try that one. Uh, and if none of those match, try that one. So um, here's one further construct that allows you to define um, descriptions in which later parts of um, the format depend upon earlier parts uh, of the format. Okay, so that's a basic summary of a bunch of the features that you can use to um, describe um, data formats. Uh, and the, the key ideas are that in addition to a, a grammar, you also get um, a description of what the type of the internal representation of the data is going to be. And so as a consequence of that, you can write functions uh, that are well typed that do things like analyze constraints. Um, so uh, there are a number of advantages, I think, to this approach. I, I think that the syntax is familiar and it's relatively intuitive to people. Struct mean, means sequence of things, array means sequence of things, union means a variety of choices. Um, it provides um, some readable uh, and executable documentation uh, of a format like uh, grammar. Uh, we've also developed a, a formal semantics of the system. Uh, that I won't um, get into, but you can ask me later if you want. Um, and it's been used uh, internally at AT&T for uh, doing things such as uh, taking log files, uh, cleaning them, uh, and um, outputting the results into formats that can easily be written into uh, databases for them. But it still takes a long time to um, uh, to write these descriptions by hand. Uh, and there is some um, investment that you need to make in order to learn this little domain specific uh, language. So it takes experts, they're much quicker for experts to, to use than for, uh, for novices. Uh, so hence in comes um, PADS version 2.0 where we'd like to investigate skipping the handwritten part of the description uh, step and uh, simply going directly from raw data uh, to uh, tools such as a converter for XML or a, um, a query engine uh, or a tool that will graph the results uh, based on some specification. So here we have just a bunch of uh, data files containing our ad hoc data. We send those into our format inference engine. Out the other side pops a data description we can pass that through our compiler, go ahead and generate tools such as a profiler or an XML converter and then take our raw data and spin those uh, through those uh, uh, other boxes and, and get out uh, an error report or a profile of what the likely values are uh, or XML format. So next section of the talk then is about uh, how we can go about how we've gone about implementing this format inference engine that takes the raw data and spits out the, uh, the pads description automatically. Okay. Uh, and this uh, inference engine is designed as a, um, uh, a series of phases. Uh, the first phase break up the raw data into a bunch of parts uh, for anal analyzing the repeated structure. The second phase we call structure discovery. It generates a simple candidate format uh, that we hope is fairly close to being a good format. Uh, and then there is um, a, a cycle that we go around uh, scoring the candidate that we've generated uh, and applying a bunch of rewriting rules that attempt uh, to optimize that score. Okay. 
When we've done that and we've come up with a format that we can't optimize any further, uh, we spit it out and it will go through the rest of the cycle. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the, the phases of these. David, yep? So you guarantee that the format you, that you spit out is, is, will be guaranteed to uh, a guaranteed representation of the input data? Or can the space... Yeah, it will, it, will, it will parse all of the data that is used as a... Um, that it has as a sample. But if there's more data, uh, it may not um, correctly generalize. Okay, so uh, step one, uh, what's the chunking and tokenization process? Okay, so um, breaking up initial data into chunks is simple. Um, there's just one chunk either per file if you give it a collection of files uh, or there's one chunk per line. Okay, so I'm going to have a little simple running example here, but we have some file with quote, number, comma, number, quote, um, or some names and commas. And we'll first off break that up into a, a series of lines or chunks. Okay, next step, um, we run over a, um, a tokenizer, a lexer, uh, over our chunks. Uh, and right now, our system has a configuration file that you can uh, manage yourself that um, allows you to express whatever tokens you want um, in terms of a set of regular expressions. Um, our default tokenizer that you get with the system um, again, is skewed towards systems data. Uh, so it contains things like integers, white space, punctuation, strings, and then a bunch of things like IP addresses, certain date formats, times, MAC addresses. Okay. So, right. So we convert our chunk data into a um, uh, series of tokens. So already there, there's some ambiguity. Possibly. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the, uh, again, it's, it's a first, first match. Um, is it the same principle? It's the same principle as Lex okay. right now. Although, oh, oh, so, not, not. so it's first longest match first or longest first match given the set of rules. And uh, we actually have, I'm not going to talk about it here, but we've actually gone and looked at um, uh, using some machine learning techniques to try to learn um, uh, characteristics of, of um, what's likely to be an IP address, what's likely to be a domain name, and then at this point in the, in the process, not um, rigorously decided upon a single tokenization, but collected up all, basically connect, collected up the DAG of all possible parses, mm -hmm. and then running that DAG of all possible parses through the, uh, through the system. Mm -hmm. and, and one reason that I'm not talking about it actually is because I think that the results have been really mixed in that it takes a lot longer to use these machine learning techniques and um, the results are only better some of the time. <laughs> um, but it's the kind of thing where I'd love to work with someone who really knows how to do machine learning well. Um, perhaps they know a lot more than I do about how to resolve some of the, the problems. Yeah. So are there defaults or some knobs or something that you use to control where types are opaque? In other words, here you've got quotes around things, so one usage of quotes might be, you know, these are just comments and I don't, and I just want a string. Um, but in other cases, the quotes are s supposed to be significant delimiters and you're supposed to keep on uh, analyzing. Um, uh, so we don't really have any, we don't have any such, uh, any such knobs. So right now we um, don't treat uh, quotes as opaque and we analyze the internal structure. Um, although at the end, we, based on the rewriting that we're, I'll show you, talk about in a second, we um, make certain decisions that a type that we've discovered is too complicated for the data it describes. And we back off on um, doing things like um, having a complicated type inside a couple of quotes, for instance. So in general, we have a process for backing off when the types are too complicated for the data that they describe and come up with an overly, what we consider to be an overly verbose description. But you would assume that things like matching quotes, then I take it, though. In other words, as um, 
you must have certain assumptions about beginning and ending. We we do um, there. So, um, I'll like two slides from now. I'll tell you about our um, our our algorithm, and it's a top-down algorithm. And um, as part of the top-down algorithm, at certain points we view what's in between quotes as um, uh, as opaque at one level of the algorithm, but then we'll break it open at the next level of recursion. But I'll show you in a second. Okay. Um, all right. I've said all that stuff. Okay. So this is okay. So that's basically just the setup. Um, uh, and and tokenization is, I think, one of the it's it's the hardest thing uh, to do. Uh, and the d the results of the rest do depend heavily on how well you do uh, in this phase. Um, so we'd love to improve it, um, but I don't exactly know how at the moment. But hey, that's okay. Okay, so how does a structured discovery algorithm work? Okay, so it's a top-down sort of divide and conquer algorithm. Um, and at each level, um, it will compute various statistics from the chunked and tokenized data. Then it's gonna uh, guess uh, from those statistics a top-level uh, description, like this is a struct, or this is a union, or this is an array. Uh, then it will partition the tokenized data into smaller chunks. Uh, and it's going to then recursively reanalyze the data in each individual uh, chunk, compute new statistics, uh, and recursively apply the algorithm. And it's going to base bottom out when we identify um, that we just have a base type in our set of chunks. So I'll give you a little picture of how this works. Um, okay, so we start out with uh, nothing so far. We have these initial sets of chunks. Um, now, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to notice that every single one of these chunks has two quotes and a, and a, a comma in it, and that's going to um, cause us to, to um, guess that the current uh, description, the current data is best described as a struct with a quote, something else, a comma, something else, a quote. We're going to run through each of these uh, lists of tokens uh, and partition it uh, such that we get this set of chunks here described um, matching this guy and this set of chunks here matching, matching that guy. And then we'll recursively go and analyze those, um, those two other sets of chunks. So here we are. This is from the last stage. Now we recursively recompute a bunch of statistics. And in this time, we guess that our description is a union of two things, uh, either um, something else over here or something else over here. We partition um, the elements of the union uh, based on um, the first token that we see in the uh, two sets of chunks that we have. So in this case, all the strings go on one side, all the ints go on the other. Um, we do the same thing with the other. Um, question mark on the right hand side of the tree and then um, at this point the set of chunks in each of these boxes um, is all just a set of base types so we can bottom out and say aha uh -huh, this is an int, this is a string, this is a string and this is an int. Okay so the uh, description that we first discover here is um, going to be a quote of a union, a comma, a union and a quote. Okay, so the interesting part is how do we do this guessing to try and come up with um, uh, a decision about, oh, this is a struct, this is a union, this is an array. So the primary thing that we do um, is we take each of our chunks and we compute a histogram. Okay, and so what's uh, in the histogram is for each different base type, what we do is we compute the percentage of the records that have a certain number of occurrences of each token. So for instance, the quote token appears twice in 100% of the records. Uh, and 0% of the time it appears once, and 0% of the time it appears zero times. The comma token appears once in 100% of the records. The integer token appears um, once 30% of the time, twice 30 I guess it's 33% probably. Once 33%, twice 33%, uh, and zero times 33%. The string appears once 33%, twice 33%. Uh, 
Okay, so once we have these histograms, uh, what we go and do is we uh, cluster sets of tokens that have similar histograms. Um, and um, before doing the cluster, we actually normalize the histograms so that they are in terms of descending size of their columns. So that means that the quote histogram is similar to the comma histogram. Um, because if you normalize by descending size, the histograms look exactly the same. Okay, so it turns out that, yeah, this is a group and that's a group. Okay, so once we have our groups. Like exact equality, like if in one tuple, there was some comma missing or one field less, you might nonetheless say. That's true. So there, um, yeah, we use this um, symmetric rel relative entropy uh, function, which I got from one of the machine learning guys in our department, which is a good way of comparing two histograms. Uh, and um, it's histograms are the same as if they, if they have the same symmetric relative entropy modulo some small delta. Um, yeah, so if there's a few errors in the file, that will um, not prevent you from classifying uh, things as being in the same category. Okay, so once we have these groups, what we uh, then do is we try to uh, find a group uh, that we have high confidence in that has a particular um, struct-like or array-like characteristic. So things are struct-like um, if they have high coverage, meaning that they're in a lot of the records, and if they have narrow distributions, meaning that there aren't very many columns in the distribution. So quote and comma very much satisfy the struct-like criterion because they're in all of the records, and they have the same number of occurrences in all of those records. Okay, so that's a good indicator of uh, a struct. And in fact, at this level, the um, uh, of the recursion, that's the strongest signal of anything that we have. So we will pick that. Then we will go and split up the ba the data based on that decision, uh, and re recompute histograms. Uh, at the next level, which because we split up the data, we're going to get a lot uh, cleaner histograms than we, we had received prior to doing that. Okay, so structs have high coverage and narrow distributions. Arrays have, um, have wide distributions as opposed to uh, structs. Um, and unions are the groups where we said, well, we didn't find anything with these, with these criteria, so we're going to subdivide the uh, data into a union, uh, and hopefully on the next iteration we'll find uh, some better indicator of one of the other structured types. Okay, so once we've decided that we have a quote, a comma, and a, um, uh, or two quotes and a comma, what we do is we run over all of the chunks and um, we look at how many orderings of the two quotes and commas are there. For each ordering, we'll have one element of a union uh, with that ordering. So in this case, there's only one ordering of quote, comma, quote. So the union part is degenerate, and we just generate a struct, uh, and we have two, and recursively have two more uh, problems that we have to uh, learn using the same uh, algorithm. Okay. So that's how division works for a struct. For a union, uh, what we do is we just look at the first token of each um, line of data and put everything with the same first token into the same um, bucket for uh, redoing things as a union. Um, and when we have, we decide, decide we have an array, um, we scan for a particular separator token uh, that yeah, has the array-like qualities. Okay, so that's how we generate an initial candidate structure. Uh, the next step um, is to score that structure and uh, to refine it using a bunch of rewriting rules.
Okay, so we have a, a large collection of rewriting rules that um, we've come up with on a relatively ad hoc um, basis. Um, what these rewriting duels, rules do is they merge um, structures, they identify overly complex elements and um, create, um, eliminate the overly complex uh, elements. Um, sometimes they add uh, constraints which add precision like um, is it the case that only a certain number of tokens appear? Um, like in our, um, in our example for the HTTP requests, uh, you might see um, get and uh, post and link in the, um, um, in the data. And so instead of saying this is a general string, we say it's actually an enumeration. Um, it's also the case that we, we fill in um, some missing uh, details, such as what are the sizes of arrays, um, how do arrays terminate, um, and um, um, what are the separators uh, for arrays. So all of this rewriting is uh, guided by um, a scoring function. Uh, and um, what that scoring function does is it balances uh, sort of two ideas. So one idea is that a description must be concise. Uh, and another idea is that a description must be precise. So um, taken in the li limit, either one of these um, is unreasonable. Um, but as a combination, it seems to work fairly well. So uh, you want your description to be, to be concise because um, people can't read enormous descriptions. And obviously, the data is its own description at, at, in the limit. Um, and uh, you want a description to be precise because imprecise descriptions don't give you much information. So if we just say, aha, this is a string of characters, you haven't done much work in understanding the data. OK, so we use an idea that's uh, very prevalent in the uh, uh, natural language uh, learning uh, community, which is uh, this idea of minimum uh, description length. Uh, so the idea is that the way that you balance these two concerns is you look at what the cost is for uh, transmitting um, the data that is described by your description. Okay? And so the cost is broken down into two factors. One is the number of bits that you need to transmit the syntax of the description. And the second component is, given that you've transmitted the syntax of the description uh, to somebody, what's the amount of information you need uh, to communicate uh, the data given uh, the description? Right? So here, if you have um, decided, for instance, the description says that this is exactly, in this place, this one character, then you don't need to transmit any information um, to say that, yes, this is exactly the character that should be there. Okay, so these two factors help you balance conciseness and, uh, and, and precision in a reasonable way. And so what we do is we apply this function to our uh, description that we generate, and we just iteratively apply rules that decrease uh, the score that we get. Uh, and so this can lead us to a local optimum instead of a global optimum. Um, but it still seems to work uh, quite nicely. OK, so we've done some evaluation of these ideas uh, on a whole collection of benchmarks. Um, most of the benchmarks, again, are drawn from this domain of systems logs um, and things like that that we're most interested in. Um, uh, and uh, you know, all of the files, so there's um, server logs and various logs that um, we found on our machines, um, as well as a few things from, uh, from AT&T. And they all range uh, you know, from a couple hundred lines, usually, to a couple thousand lines. Okay. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that we did was we tried to me measure um, um, the correctness of our uh, analysis in terms of how much data we needed to generate um, uh, descriptions that were appropriately general. In other words, that given some small amount of data um, would parse 90% or 95% of the rest of the data that we had from that source. Um, okay, I have a question. Yep. For all these data sources, do you know a priori that there exists some paths description that will describe it? Yeah, yeah. So we, we also, for all those data sources, we wrote our own uh, 
description in pads by hand first. Um, and we also tried to do some uh, qualitative, um, we have a qualitative measure of how well did, we, did the machine learning description do versus the, uh, uh, versus the handwritten one. Um, uh, though it's hard to eliminate our own personal bias from such a, uh, an analysis. Um, right, so what I really should have here though is I should have another line that says how much um, data do we need to generate descriptions that correctly guess 100% of the data. Um, but I, I don't have that, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, well, anyway, I think the, the, the bottom line is that a lot of these uh, uh, descriptions are sort of thousands of lines long or 1,000, 2,000 lines long, uh, and it takes about 5 or 10% of the data uh, in order to, um, um, for our algorithm to generate a description that works almost all the time. Uh, in terms of execution time, um, it takes um, under a minute for our uh, algorithm to work on um, any of these data files that are about 1,000 to 3,000 lines of code. It, it depends a little bit on the complexity of the format, though. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the most time-consuming ones are this like ASL.log and AI3000. Uh, and this one's actually, you know, 3,000 lines long, and this one's only 1,000 lines long, and, you know, it, it takes this other one um, quite a bit, quite a bit longer. So it, a lot of it uh, depends upon the complexity of, of the format. But generally, in terms of, if you're a programmer, and you say, okay, I want to go and, you know, manipulate this data. Um, you could press a button, wait 30 seconds, wait a minute, and you have, uh, a format in pads that you can run your compiler on and um, continue your work. So it's fully in the normal, you know, compile time cycle in terms of a programmer getting work done. Uh, and just as a, another sort of reference point, the last column here suggests how long it took um, us to write um, a version of the format by hand and debug it. Okay, so. Um, and, and one thing is, so my postdoc did this when he first got here. Uh, and um, so this, this one here is the, uh, uh, the time that includes downloading and installing the system and getting it all to work and reading some of the manual and doing that stuff. So you can say, like, it takes a couple days for a first-time user to learn the system. Uh, and after that, you know, writing a description in pads for some data source that's uh, not too complicated takes, you know, maybe it takes um, half an hour, maybe it takes two hours, something uh, in that range, versus one minute for the automated uh, analysis. How long are the handwritten descriptions typically? Um, I don't know, 100 lines of code? It's my guess. Um, it, it, it can vary, it can vary a fair amount. Okay, uh, one other thing we did was we, we took a look at, um, at least for small files, um, what, um, is the, uh, what is the scaling like? Um, and roughly speaking, um, as long as we don't run out of memory, the, um, and we don't in any of these small files, but we would on files that were much larger, um, the, uh, the process seems to scale a bit lim linearly with uh, the number of lines of, of, of code. And, and more important um, is the constant factor uh, that is associated with the complexity of each uh, line in the description than the, the number of lines in the, in the file, for instance. Okay, so, so that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, what's next? Well, there are a couple things that I really um, I'm excited about uh, doing next. So one thing is um, I'm working with a couple of my friends 
uh, on scaling the inference system up so that it can handle um, sources that are millions of lines of, uh, of data long, uh, like they have at AT&T. So um, in, in some sense, the automated analysis is much more useful potentially for the data sources that are really, really huge. Uh, Kathleen wanted to um, create a description for some source that um, was uh, um, tens of millions of lines long for use um, internally at AT&T. And one thing she found that after about one and a half million lines, um, the, um, the format um, completely changed. So it was a complete nightmare for her to go ahead and uh, attempt uh, to generate this file, which partly motivates this uh, so what description. Is the problem with scaling it up to millions and millions of lines. Is it the algorithms, or just that the descriptions tend to be really complicated? Um, it's the it's the algorithms and the amount of 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 data that they use. Um, um, what we're doing to scale them up uh, is simply to um, apply the algorithm in batches. Um, so run the learning algorithm over the first bit of data, um, generate the candidate description, then run it over the next bit of data, and um, wherever there are errors, basically populating a data structure uh, in a way to accumulate um, data at particular nodes, then do more learning problems in the incorrect spots, and then add that back into the uh, overall description, the new descriptions, and then apply some of the rewriting rules uh, in ways that don't um, completely change the entire description that you have. It seems like it would be perhaps a good application for a MapReduce style, where you're, you have all these workers working on different segments of this huge file, each coming up with a description, and then the, the reduction somehow has to deal with how do you the, merge? merging these together, and the merging might involve making a new union or a new struct if you had different phases or something like that. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's sort of a slightly different way of doing things. Our current way is, given a starting description, which um, could be written by hand or could be machine generated, we're, what we try to do is preserve as much of the existing structure as we can while making the necessary changes and I think it's easier for us to preserve the existing structure. Um, well, you could still do it with a map reduced. You can still farm out that existing structure to many, many different nodes. But it's, it's a, it, there's a slightly different algorithm than two things independently coming up with potentially completely different things and trying to merge, mm -hmm. as opposed to localizing in the description where the errors occur. Yes and relearning only that part of the description. It's two slightly different yeah. techniques, and we're currently working on that first one, but uh, we did actually consider the second one. We just thought it would be technically trickier, trickier. but whatever. But yeah, you had a... Yes, I'm still trying to understand the, the difficulty in scaling the inference up to millions of lines. So the issue is not the millions of lines. Supposing there is a 10 million line data source mm -hmm. whose grammar is simply that you have alternating integers and strings. Okay. Then really, to do the inference, you just need like maybe 10, 20 of those records, right? Then you will be able to do the inference. So you don't really have to look at the entire thing. Um, yeah, if you're, yeah if, you're, if you're lucky, right, you can look at the first you know, few lines, infer the right description, and then just validate that the rest of the, right. the, rest of the data matches. So probably the complication happens when, uh, in, if you, if you, for these logs, which are millions of lines, an individual record whose grammar that you have to recognize is very large, probably. Yeah, right? or, or, it, you know, or you just pick the, yeah, I mean, or you just pick the wrong set of lines to look at initially. That, you know, there's some change in some protocol that happens partway through. It's something that Kathleen has found happens sometimes in these logs. Just pick the first set of lines, or do you sample uniformly across all the lines? Right now, we're just going to, I mean, it, we could easily sample randomly, but we're just going to pick the first set of lines and then go through and validate the rest of the description. And yeah, if, if all the rest of the description is exactly the same, then there's you know, no change that needs to be done. Um, but there are definitely cases where that's 
just doesn't happen. Um, and I mean, these, can, these descriptions can, can grow to be quite complicated. So I mean, one, one part that I, I didn't um, mention is in the, one of the things that the rewriting phase does um, is it makes a table out of all the data. And it looks for functional dependencies um, between, so is this column functionally dependent upon this other column, basically, in the data? Uh, and if it is, it will put that into the description. So that kind of algorithm is using um, all the data at once in order to um, uh, do this. And it's comparing all columns against all other columns. Um, and um, what we want to do is basically summarize that information in a chunk. And then in the next chunk, you know, check. Is, th is that, uh, did we overspecify because of the specifics of the, of the previous uh, column? Or does that relationship that we've inferred still hold? Um, and we can't, it'll be too slow to, yeah. So you're, when you say lines, I mean, in some sense you're, because you're doing the lexing, you're not really dependent on line structure, right? I mean, no. if, if I'm outputting messages which are multi, if I'm outputting sort of information about messages being sent and received, and the message format is multi-line text. Yeah, right? that's, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. Okay. No. Yeah, so... Um, one thing on, that's on our hundreds of messages and the orders of those messages differ and the fields of the messages change. I mean, then that gets more, more complex. Yeah, I um, on our to do list is being able to specify the paragraphs mm -hmm. uh, that you want your learning system to process the data in, in chunks. You basically just you just at the beginning of the algorithm, you need some way to get started with having a set of um, candidates that you have some reason to believe there'll be some commonality. So are you saying that the way it works right now, if you did have the case with some multi-line things, that it, it might chunk just at the lines and uh, not notice the correspondence of sort of togetherness of groups of lines? Uh, yeah, that's right. It, it won't. It won't. It won't. Um, so it, it won't measure or it won't find structure across lines? It won't currently find structure across lines. What we would need to do is give it some reason to break things up. I'm assuming that people often have to go in and at least give meaningful names. I mean, this would find yes, structure, but right. obviously it's going to have you know just made up names for everything, with, which in an XML file would just look like gibberish. Right? Yeah. Oh yeah, I kind of stopped here in the middle, but I, I the next thing I was going to I, I forgot. I don't know. I guess I was I don't know whatever. What a great talk. <laughs> no, but so actually one of, the, one of the next things that I'm really interested in, in doing, and this is what um, my student uh, Chan is, is working on, is um, so there's, there's this problem with the, the handwritten descriptions, you know, it's slower. Um, the um, uh, automated ones, um, you definitely have a problem with these um, machine generated names, which makes the resulting description look more complex. Uh, and Oftentimes, you, you, you know, just generating the description isn't the end result. If you're cleaning some data that you want to put into a database, you um, might have to refer to different fields, do some small transformation on those fields, normalize um, dates or times um, or uh, any variety of other things. And um, so you, you, you need to be able to get some hooks on the different bits of the data that you're interested in. Uh, and so what... Um, Jan is looking at is um, sort of a fusion of the two ideas, partly handwritten, partly um, automated, uh, in which you take your data and you start um, editing it to insert various um, bits of description inside it. So um, here's an example. Here's my, my hockey stats. Um, and what I'm interested in is I'm interested in the name of my player, the age, and the salary, for instance. Um, and what this line here says, uh, I expect to see after this line, um, star says, you know, a repeated set of records that match this format. And I'd like to tag the name field, uh, the age field, and the salary field. Um, so um, I view this <laughs> almost um, as though you are um, um, 
well, I mean, one way of view is sort of like you're working in XML, but you have raw text as the starting point. And you're placing your own little tags with some additional information uh, in terms of how to read the rest of or parts of the description. Formatting by example. Formatting by example. That's right. It's formatting by example. And so, yeah, you're using the, the structure of the data that's already there to allow you to elide tons of, of stuff that you would otherwise have to do. Uh, and then the, other, the next part of this um, is to couple this with a new scripting language that can refer to the various tags that you've uh, inserted into the different places. So um, I sort of have some vague ideas of basing this um, more or less around xQuery. And um, here's a little script, this is, you know, this is my way out ideas part of the talk. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know what link is. Sorry. Okay, we'll have to talk. Okay. <laughs> you really should know what link is. <laughs> okay, tell me what link is. All right, and anyway, so this is a, a little script that um, maybe it does what link maybe it does what link does, but you know it, it selects from the stats field and um, it's ordered by um, the name field and uh, it prints out data that you know is a name followed by some spaces, the age and the um, uh, and the salary. So there you go. Um, so there's that idea. Uh, and then another set of things that I'm, I'm thinking about also is, is moving towards um, not describing individual files, but describing collections of files. So um, at Princeton and at at and um, everyone who builds a distributed system um, also generates their own little monitoring system, which Goes and collects up log files from all over the, um, all over the, you know, all over the, the place, um, and they often have these complex directory structures. Uh, like Mike Friedman, I, as an example, he has some complex directory structure that has you know one directory for each machine on Planet Lab that he's interested in monitoring, and then subdirectories for times, and then more. Um, uh, directories for um, different kinds of information. Uh, and what I'd like to do is extend the pad such that it doesn't specify just one file, but it uh, specifies entire parts of the file system and generates for you uh, an interface um, against which you can query the files that are in the file system, manipulate them, transform them, um, get information uh, about them. Uh, another thing that we can possibly do um, is generate uh, the monitoring infrastructure that goes and fetches all the data from various different places uh, and archives it uh, for you uh, centrally. So, yeah. Um, so those are some, some things that I'm interested in, in, um, uh, in, um, in doing next. There's a number of bits of related work. Um, in terms of just languages, there were a number of languages that were made up in the networking community um, some time ago. Uh, DataScript and packet types are one of them. that allows you to describe binary uh, data, um, and they use this sort of type-based metaphor um, and generate inter internal representations for you. So uh, PADS is inspired by a lot of those um, uh, uh, efforts. Um, I think some of the, the new things are um, um, in terms of the way we do error processing with the parse descriptors. Uh, we also have a, a paper on the semantics that describes the semantics of um, a number of these different um, uh, languages. Uh, and in terms of the learning stuff, we've borrowed ideas uh, from a number of different people in the machine learning community and people who are learning uh, the structure of XML. So the idea for our top-down um, recursive Structure discovery algorithm is uh, based on ideas by Arasu and Garcina, Garcia Molina, um, who looked at how to extract data from uh, XML or from web pages. Um, and um, we coupled that with other ideas that other people have had uh, in terms of using the minimum description length principle to uh, optimize the descriptions that uh, you get. OK. so. Summary is PADS 1.0 is a, a language where you can write down descriptions by hand. PADS 2.0 improves productivity by automatically generating these descriptions. PADS 3.0 um, 
Um, it's going to be better yet, though we're not exactly sure what it's going to do. But no, it's, it, hopefully it'll combine uh, some of the ideas uh, from each of those um, and um, uh, um, give you the control of the handwritten with the uh, efficiency um, of, the, um, of the automated version. All right, thanks. Is there a download? Where do I? Uh, where there do is I a download. Go? There is. Uh, do we have? Oh, here we go. Look at that. Uh, yeah. So you can um, go to www.padsproj.org, and we have a couple of demos online that you can take a look at if you want. Um, so there's a demo of the basic pads uh, infrastructure, and um, um, that will show you a handwritten description and some of the tools that we can generate, like an XML converter. Uh, and then there's this learning demo where there's um, a bunch of different um, files that you can select from and look at, and then you can click the button and you can um, you can see the descriptions that you get out, and then you can see the um, um, what happens when you apply one of the tools using those descriptions. So, will you combine the, the hand reach and description with the inference? So, actually, do you trust the hand reach description? Or say it's just a suggestion, and the system figures out that um, that description doesn't match the So right now we're building a new system which uh, will do this incremental processing. Given a starting point that's a description either that's been learned or that's been written, written by hand, um, apply it to segment after segment of a large data source. Uh, and if it parses the large data source, great. If it doesn't, then it finds the places where the description is wrong, and it will relearn those nodes and rewrite them uh, and include them. So does that answer your question? Yeah. But if, for example, the description is generated by kind of like the inference of the previous set of data, okay. then the possibility um, of that description is correct is higher than the handwritten one because the handwritten seems to be kind of like um, the, 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 the description in the mind of the programmer, right? So how do we... So, so we do have a tool also that if you have a handwritten description, and we have this like, accumulator tool, you can apply it to a data set, and then it will give you a list of all the errors that it found. So you can look at, you know, is that an error in the description or is it an error in the data? Uh. Thank you, David. Okay, good. Yay. <laughs>